All right. Thanks, Sophia, and uh, and thanks everyone for for attending. So, yeah, my name is Pedro Bento. So, what I'm going to be presenting today is is this paper here. So, female entrepreneurship in the U.S. 1982 to 2012, and I'll be talking about it, uh, implications of, of what I do for welfare and, and aggregate output. Um, so here's just some motivation for for the paper itself. So uh, the graph here on the top left is just so again, this is from 1982 to, to 2012. This is in, in census years. Um, so this is the women-owned share of firms. So this is the number of firms that are considered owned by women, um, which uh, the criteria here is that ownership is at least 50% uh, female um, as a share of all firms um, in the data. So you see this going from uh, under 30% in 1982 um, and increasing pretty consistently. Um, by the end of the sample, it's around 45%. Um, so this is this is this increase is, is over and above any increase in um, labor market participation by women, um, which isn't huge over this time period. A, a lot of that was done um, before this starts. Um, and so on the right hand side here, we have a graph where I. I look at something called an entrepreneurship rate. So literally, this is just the number of firms uh, in the, on the left divided by uh, the number of people uh, that are working. Okay, so the, the labor force, <clears throat> and we see this going from uh, nine percent in 1982 for women up to 18 or over 18 percent by the end of the sample. So it's more than doubled uh, relative to the number of women in the actual workforce. Okay, and the same number for men has gone uh, from 17 to 20. So so marginal increase. Uh, in relative terms. Okay, and I'll, and I'll show you a little later that, that we see similar experience in uh, all sectors of the economy. I have a question. Yeah. Like, very, very soon. Um, what do you consider as a firm here? I mean, do you consider like self-employment uh, yeah. some sort of firm? Yes. Yeah. So, so anything that shows up in a firm, uh, basically in the IRS data. So this is uh, including, so this is going to be employers basically, plus any non-employers. Yeah, so it's including all of them. Okay. And so we can see that on the right hand side. So from what you've heard in this kind of literature on business dynamism, we've heard that the, the number of firms is declining, or at least the startup rate is declining uh, in the US. So when you include all of these uh, non employers, as well as as uh, the employer firms, you see that in fact, the, the number of firms. So the, again, this is the line in the middle uh, of these three lines. That's trending upward a little bit over time. This is the number of firms divided by the workforce um, in total in the United States, and we see this is going up. So I have a paper with uh, Diego Rosusia talking about that. What this picture is showing you is that this is mostly being driven by um, an increase in the the female entrepreneurship rate, um, female owned firms, whereas the the number of firms that are owned by males have has only increased a little bit over the same time period. So what I do in this paper is to document these and, and some other kind of related trends um, over time in the US. Um, I'm gonna be interpreting this data using a model of entrepreneurship. So this is basically gonna be a Hoppenheim type, uh, Hoppenheim type model um, extended to allow for some barriers to entrepreneurship uh, that are specific to women. I'm going to use this model to interpret the data in order to quantify these barriers that I'll, that I'll talk about in a second and how they change over time. And then I'll be using the model to quantify the, the contribution of the decline in these barriers, um, which is something that I'll, I'll document to, uh, to welfare and also to aggregate output per worker in the United States. So broadly speaking, that's, that's what I'm gonna be doing. So I mentioned these barriers. So there are going to be, um, Four classes of barriers that I'll that I'll look at uh, using this model and using this data. So the first is a barrier to starting or running a firm. Um, so you can think about this as any kind of uh, barrier that would show up as as some kind of fixed cost. Um, and again, this is going to be for women relative to men, for female entrepreneurs relative to to male entrepreneurs. So this is. Uh, should be capturing, for example, the cost of generating an idea for a new product or service, um, acquiring any required permits or licenses, um, societal attitudes, um, these kinds of things. So, for example, um, a fraction of workers with occupational licenses, 
um, has increased from 5% to 23% since 1950 in the United States. Um, so to the extent that this impacts women-owned businesses differently than men, uh, perhaps more, perhaps less, um, then this could show up um, as, as, a, as something contributing to this barrier. Um, another example, there's, there's at least anecdotal evidence um, in the U.S. of uh, female entrepreneurs hiding the sex uh, of the owners of a firm from their customers, whether those customers are, are kind of uh, uh, final good demanders or uh, 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 people involved in uh, government procurement contracts, these kinds of things. Okay. There's evidence that they tried to hide the sex of, of the owner from them. Okay, so these, again, uh, would be costs incurred. So second barrier is, has to do with the, the cost of acquiring or using capital. Um, so for example, before the 1980s, um, women required a, a male cosigner for any business loan in the United States, regardless of whether they had collateral or regardless of how credit worthy they were. Uh, so for example, uh, Lillian Lincoln Lambert, uh, this is the first African-American woman graduate from Harvard Business. Uh, she needed the signature of her 17 year old uh, dependent son in order to get a business loan. Um, another example, uh, there's was an established, already established successful architect um, who was trying to get a business loan to expand her business. Um, and in a, a well-known bank uh, in the United States, she was patted on the head by a, a reputable banker who, who explained that, you know, with a smirk, we don't give business loans to women, obviously. Um, so these will be, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Gonzalo from the bank here. Can I ask a, a quick question uh, related to the figures that you showed us uh, at the beginning? Yeah. So are you including the uh, both non-employer and employer businesses in those figures or is yeah. just uh, employer businesses? Yeah, it's everything. It's everything. Okay. It's everything. Yeah. And do you have a, an idea? Do, do you have sense uh, which kind of uh, which type of firms are driving the those, uh, That's a good question, and I knew the answer to that a year ago, and now uh, I don't. I so I could be wrong with this. I so I think the the trend was the same in employer firm only for employer firms, but uh, but less so. So it wasn't as dramatic. Um, so this model that I'm going to show you um, can, in principle, account for that. Um, I'm going to show you that women-owned firms are much smaller. So to the extent that we think of non-employer, this is how I'm going to think of a non-employer firms. They're just small firms. Um, they're firms with uh, essentially uh, optimal amount of labor that's less than one, so that the owner is providing all of the, the labor for the firm. And any, any, any firm that would be counted as an employer firm, this is one where the owner might be working, but then there's also uh, other labor being hired. So that's obviously not the only way that we can interpret this distinction between non-employers and employers in the US. Um, but so in my paper with, with Diego on just non-employers and employers more generally, I, we provide a lot of evidence that that's a, at least a good starting point of, of a way to think about, um, these firms, not that a non-employer is the same as Walmart. Um, but to the extent that you're willing to think of a small convenience store with one worker as being in the same industry of, as Walmart, there should be no objection to thinking about a non-employer. Uh, being in the same industry as a small uh, convenience store. Okay, because but still you have like this distinction between, for instance, unincorporated and incorporated businesses. So unincorporated businesses usually are uh, more uh, concentrated in non-employer businesses, and and because they are unincorporated, they, they have less access to the financial markets, for instance, to credit. It could be, uh, yeah, it, certainly it could be. So what we're going to be focusing on, it, it so with respect to this particular slide. Um, what I'm going to be focusing on here is is barriers over and above those that just more generally affect small businesses. So I, I want you to think about this cost of acquiring capital as something that's um, hitting a, a, a woman owned business relative to a male owned business that's otherwise identical. Okay. So, so the identification here is going to be so it's a, it's a, on the, the third bullet here. Um, there's evidence for higher borrowing rates, higher collateral and smaller loans um, for the same business, but that is owned by a woman rather than a man. Um, and in fact, I'll be using one data point from uh, uh, the fairly Robin Robinson paper 
uh, that show, this is in 2004, that they're looking at capital labor ratios and they find that women owned firms um, that are otherwise identical, so they have a bunch of controls there, um, use 14% less capital than, than an otherwise identical male owned firm. Okay, thanks, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so the third barrier I'm going to be thinking about is, is, is related to the second. So this is going to be the cost. Of... Yeah, I have a question out of ignorance. I, I had the idea that um, there was some evidence that women were less likely to default on their loans. Uh, this comes from the microcredit uh, programs in India, this type of stuff that uh, one of right. one of the. Yeah, one of the, the, the ways to justify those was that women were less likely to, to default. Is this the case? And if if it is, why doesn't this translate in lower borrowing costs? So the story here is is going to be that there's some kind of barrier. So the the disadvantage of what of, of how I'm doing things here is that I'm 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 getting measures of these barriers in a kind of a Shane Clean Al 2009 way. Um, so I'm going to have a structural model here that tells me what things should look like, absent any barriers, and I'm going to uh, assume that any deviation from that is due to some kind of barrier. So the benefit of this is I should be capturing anything that's going on that can affect uh, business decisions in the particular way that I'm looking at. Okay? That includes unobserved things, that includes things that we can't measure, etc. The disadvantage is that I cannot point directly to a particular policy or a particular something in the economy that's causing it. I can point to examples out there that will be captured in this particular way, um, but that's about it. So, um, yeah, I, I was, I was, my question was going more uh, on the side of the literature, since you're you're saying that uh, there's evidence that they they face higher borrowing rates. Uh, whether there was some discussion of why that was the case, uh, provided that they, they default with uh, less probability, with the uh, they are less likely to default if this is the case as well, because uh, right. uh, I, I had heard this discussion in, in, uh, with regard to, to, to the Indian uh, microcredit mm -hmm. programs. So, so the problem with a lot of this um, in a country like the US is that it's, it's hard to get data, explicit data on, um, on what's going on along some margins. So for example, if there's discrimination happening, if bankers simply do not want to loan to women, we are not going to be measuring that directly. Nobody's going to say that out loud. Yeah. Now, that was different before the 1980s. That's why I have some evidence here that doesn't apply to my sample, purely because it was okay to talk about um, back then. Yeah. And so we could get this kind of direct evidence, um, anecdotal or otherwise. Now it's more based on, um, and so we have some survey data. Uh, but but most of of the evidence that we have is is based on kind of indirect evidence or these mystery shoppers or or, or things like that. Yeah. Um, so I will talk about some of that evidence, but but where could this be coming from? So it could be from some kind of discrimination. Um, it could be from some kind of misplaced um, statistical what people call statistical discrimination. Um, it could be from all sorts of uh, of, of sources. Um, it could be just from laws that are not kind of directly uh, laws that are not treating men and women uh, owners differently, but have some kind of differential impact on on, on females versus males. So it, it could be any of that. Um, so the similar cost of employing workers. <clears throat> so this could simply be coming from a higher cost of acquiring credit, so from the last slide, um, to the extent that workers are paid for through some kind of revolving credit, um, some kind of working capital, um, a higher cost of capital is going to imply a higher cost of, of, uh, of um, hiring and using workers. Um, on top of that, for example, if workers have preferences over the sex of, of the owner, um, then uh, Female entrepreneurs may have to provide more kind of non wage benefits, more at work amenities to attract workers. Um, so, some evidence is there in, in Gallup polls um, that take surveys and have taken surveys over time 
um, they do they have found that that over time workers have become increasingly indifferent about the, the sex of their boss. Um, they have become less likely over time to prefer a man uh, to prefer working for a man, and at the same time have become more likely to prefer working for a woman uh, for a woman. Uh, the last one here is uh, consumer discrimination. So this would be uh, a consumer's preferences um, over where they're buying their their goods and services, okay? whether from a, a firm that's owned by men versus a firm that's owned by women. Um, to the extent that consumers have a preference here, this is going to be affecting the demand, uh, the differential demand to these two types of firms. Um, this has been looked at a little bit in the literature uh, with respect to black entrepreneurship. So Becker thought about this, um, Moraz and Bronars have thought about this. Um, there is some evidence of this as well. Um, so for example, the US Department of Transportation historically has interpreted laws that are not necessarily about this, but nonetheless have interpreted laws in such a way to either preclude women from bidding for government procurement contracts um, or to make it more difficult for women to win a procurement contract. Essentially value a bid from a, from a woman um, lower than a, than an otherwise identical bid from a man. Um, and they find evidence that not only has this been the case in the past, but it's still an issue as late as uh, 2014 um, from uh, federal US uh, procurement contracting. So those are the, the four types of barriers to entrepreneurship I'm going to be thinking about. Um, so what I'm going to do with this, again, is I'm, I'm going to interpret the data using my model in such a way that I can infer the overall size or significance of each type of barrier relative to men. Okay, so that's the key here. It's going to be relative to a male entrepreneur. Um, I've, again, I'm, I'm not going to be identifying particular observed barriers, but in principle, um, the framework is such that I can estimate the total impact of any, uh, any kind of barrier through these four classes including unobserved or difficult to quantify ones. The way I'm setting up the model here and the way I'm interpreting the data is going to allow me to measure the impact of these barriers um, on outcomes over and above the impact from labor market barriers. Okay, so uh, labor market data I'm going to be taking as given. And so I'm going to be uh, inferring these barriers that are affecting female entrepreneurs relative to male entrepreneurs um, over and above any kind of distortions or any kind of other barriers that might be affecting labor market decisions themselves. Okay? And so the, 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 key, the, the goal here is to, is to get a number for, for each of the outcomes that I'm interested in, to get a number that I can think of as being the impact of these barriers over and above what Shea, Hurst, Jones, and Kleino have already measured um, as the impact of labor market, uh, declines in labor market um, distortions or barriers. Uh, in their 2019 paper over uh, essentially the same time period. So some relevant literature here. Uh, the first is just in general entrepreneurship over time. So again, I have that paper with with uh, Diego um, that shows you know the, the analog of this entrepreneurship rate increasing over time. And so this paper is showing that um, the increase in in female entrepreneurship accounts for almost the, the entire increase. Um, Shea Hurst, Jones, and Kleino have this paper on female labor force participation um, that are, are the same in, in spirit as what I'm doing, uh, but focusing on labor market outcomes, um, human capital decisions, um, labor market participation decisions, um, and outcomes like uh, differential wages per effective a unit of human capital, um, occupational decisions, et cetera. Okay. And then they also uh, kind of back out a, a, an estimate of the impact of the decline in all those barriers on um, GDP per worker over time. And finally, uh, obviously, it's related to a literature on female entrepreneurship. Um, so the existing literature here is either, generally speaking, has been either a description of trends. So, for example, the, the fraction of businesses owned by women, which, which I, I started with, um, or focused on identifying particular barriers. So there's, there's a, a large literature out there focusing on a particular barrier or trying to get evidence of a particular barrier. Um, again, this paper is, is attempting to quantify the impact of all the relevant barriers, um, including those that, that aren't being measured or those that we don't observe. 
Uh, now, so, so is the last point. So this is the first paper that kind of explicitly tries to quantify both the the decline in barriers over time, um, or any change in the barriers over time, and the impact of that on on aggregate outcomes. Um, a recent exception to that is uh, a, a, a new paper by Chiplankar and and Goldberg. Um, which is very similar in spirit to what I'm doing here, only they're looking at Indian data and they're using a framework that's a little more geared to uh, a setting where informality plays a big role, um, <clears throat> but otherwise very, uh, very similar in spirit. Okay, so uh, let me show you a little more data um, on top of what, what I looked at before. So just to give you an idea where all this is coming from. So all of this, this data is from women-owned business surveys uh, or more generally, the, the survey of business owners, or the, the the title has changed over time, but essentially that the survey of business owners uh, that's done in the U.S. in five-year intervals on on census years. Um, they are currently doing them on a yearly basis. Um, the employment data is coming from the CPS, so this is just going to be total employed civilian non-institutional population. Um, the firm level data here. Uh, does not include public corporations. So it does include corporations, just not public corporations. So in terms of capturing all the population of firms, I'm capturing virtually all of them. Not many firms are, are public corporations. At the same time, it's, it's important to note that public corporations, although they're a small fraction of firms, they still employ a large fraction of the workforce, they still produce a large fraction of uh, GDP. So to the extent that the trends that I'm looking at are happening at the same time throughout public corporations, then we can think about my analysis as being, um, as capturing what's going on for the whole economy. To the extent that's not going on, um, then I'm going to be essentially as assuming that it does anyway, okay? So, so then you'll want to uh, adjust uh, what I'm saying for that, okay? Um, now, I have seen some studies talking about how things are changing over time in public corporations with respect to CEOs, et cetera, uh, and other executive positions at public corporations, um, but I don't really get into that in the paper. Uh, all I can say is that there do seem to be trends going in the same direction, uh, but nobody has done uh, this kind of analysis for public corporations yet. Okay, a uh, first slide here is just to show that the, the trends I was showing you on the first slide, um, this is not a story about structural transformation. This is happening across sectors in the United States. Now, these are relatively broad sectors, um, but this is what I can get if I wanna go all the way back to 1982 or, or even back past the 2000s really. Um, but in these nine sectors, um, it does show a dramatic increase in uh, the, the female entrepreneurship rate as, as measured before uh, in every sector. Okay? Some, uh, in some, it's more, and in some, there's less, but it's happening in every sector. Um, and I should mention, I guess, there's no clear pattern here in terms of they tend... Uh, so I, I've checked whether there's... Uh, you know, a, a larger increase in female entrepreneurship rate in sectors that where firms are smaller, where firms are larger, um, anything like that. I see no clear relationship. Okay, this is just something that seems to be happening across the board. And there's no clear David, reason why in some sectors more than others. Yeah, go ahead. David, this data is from the survey of business owners, right? Not from the CPS or... or... So these numbers are a uh, number of businesses over workforce. So the workforce is from the CPS. Okay. Workforce by sector. And then the, the number of businesses is from the, the SBO. Survey. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> that's all I'm really going to be saying by sector. At least that's all I'll be showing you. Some of the calculations I do are by sector, but um, I'm going to be using a one sector model um, essentially, because I don't have all the data that I need by sector over this time period. But just to understand this graph, can you can you remind us what the entrepreneurship rate was? So this is yeah. the fraction of businesses owned by women in the no. sector. No, no. Okay. Here, so this is just the total number of businesses owned by women in a sector divided by the number of women in that sector. 
Okay. So this is a direct analog of the entrepreneurship rates from the first slide. Okay. Yeah. So it's just this. We see similar thing for uh, the the share of firms that are owned by women. And that is in the paper. Pedro, yeah. um, I had a question about uh, public corporations, about yeah. the discussion that you were having. Um, that uh, from what I've seen of this models about entrepreneurship, they usually like have this like um, entrepreneurial sector, which is like bears. I mean, like the entrepreneur basically carries all the risk, and they also have like a I don't know, like a typical like a diversified uh, sector that uh, it's it's aimed to resemble a public corporation. So they basically try to bound uh, the degree in which the entrepreneurship sector uh, impacts the whole economy. So, I mean, do you have something like that in, in your model or? or no, so, not? But, uh, but essentially, so if you're going to do something like that, really, you can just take whatever measure you're happy with in terms of the, the significance of public corporations in the economy. So, and I'm sorry, I can't remember now. I, I, the number that's popping into my head is something like 40% of employment. But it could be wildly wrong, but let's say it's 40% of employment. So again, to the extent that the same things are happening within public corporations, I could just say that this is all capturing. Yeah. That, okay. To the sure. extent that it's not to the extent that uh, public corporations um, as a whole are set up in such a way that nothing has changed over time, except things like productivity, et cetera. Um, if that's the case, then. Um, Assuming you're not setting up the model in such a way where, you know, you're shutting down general equilibrium effects. So, assuming the model is still set up in the same way, it's just that the barriers are not hitting this, 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 uh, upper tail of firms, which is basically mm -hmm. what they would be. Um, <clears throat> then this would be affecting. Essentially, you'd be, you'd be cutting. You would be cutting, uh, the impact on aggregate output, um, uh, by 40%, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, now the impact on, um, I'll be talking about the impact a, a little bit on the, uh, on, of the impact on wages. So the, the impact on wages would, would still be, I guess about 60%, uh, sorry, down by 40% to a first approximation. And then the impact on welfare is another question. Then you have to think about if you model public corporations as not having entrepreneurs, they're just some bodiless uh, thing that are, you know, owned by a, a, a large number of people in the economy, then uh, the welfare would probably be st still the same as I have here. So you wouldn't need to cut that. Okay. Yeah, so I was wondering because I, I had seen those other papers like Buera's papers and Caghetti and Denardi and, and sure, yeah, sure, they sure. had these, this whole other sector. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. But I think that's especially used in, in kind of setups where they're trying to capture um, financial constraints and these things. So I don't yeah. have those. And so I, I didn't bother. Yeah, and I think the, the idea for that feature is, is, is because it helps to solve the model easily, yeah. uh, rather than because you can capture all the features in, in terms of right. firm dynamics. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm focusing, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you this, these outcomes every five years. Um, I will be calculating all those, but at the end of the day, I'm focusing on, you know, what does 2012 look like relative to 1982? And in part for that reason, and in part, because it's, it's much simpler, um, I'm just ignoring dynamics and I'm just looking at, I'm basically comparing a steady state in 2012 to a steady state in 1982. Uh, um, and so, yeah, because of that, I have no trouble solving this model. Yeah, it's very simple. Okay, here's another measure that I will be using um, that I will be interpreting with my model. So this is average revenue per firm um, at women owned firms relative to male owned firms. And so we see that this is around 29% in uh, 1982 and this is around 32% by the end of the samples. This has increased somewhat. Okay? Um, this is specifically the data that I cannot um, go back with um, and this is important. And so uh, this is why I'm using a one sector model. <clears throat> um, this is something different. So this is uh, more like uh, what Shane Klee and I are looking at. Um, this is the average revenue product of labor um, relative to the average revenue product of 
sorry, the average revenue product of labor at women-owned firms relative to the same thing at male-owned firms. And so here I am um, controlling for industry. Um, I'm controlling for industry in each year um, and getting this ratio. And this ratio is relatively high at the beginning of the sample. It's at around uh, 1.25, one and a quarter. Uh, by the early 90s, it's already down to almost zero, and, uh, and it doesn't go any higher after that. Um, so this essentially, you can think about this as just revenue over wage bill uh, at women-owned firms relative to male-owned firms, um, controlling for the size of the firm and controlling for the industry. Uh, do you have a question? What's that? Oh, sorry. Okay, and I'll be using this data in, in a similar way uh, to Shane clean out 2009. So this is, I'm going to be using this to, to back out this, this tax on, on labor, um, labor used by women on firms, uh, relative to male on firms. Um, that's most of the data I'll be using. So it, it would also be interesting to know, um, if, and to what extent female owned firms grow faster or slower than male owned firms. Um, Conditional on on survival or unconditionally, it uh, would be interesting to know differences in exit rates. So I don't have data, uh, unfortunately. So again, I can't go back at all. What I do have is some data for 2007 and 2012, and so I can at least look at um, growth rates conditional on survival for women-owned versus male-owned firms, again by industry, um, and also by uh, how old they are at at the moment between 2007 and 2012 um, in the US. And what I find is that there's no difference in average growth rates. Um, so this is conditional on, on survival. I don't have exit rates, um, although I'll talk a little later about some other data that's out there um, that has talked a little bit about differences in exit rates. So I, I will get come back to that. So I'm going to assume in my framework that there um, is no difference in growth rates and there is no difference in exit rates. Um, and in fact, today, I'm just going to assume a, a static model uh, just to make things easier to present. Um, so it's just going to be a, a one shot game. Uh, firms show up, they produce and, and we're done. Uh, but in the paper, I assume that they exit at the same rate and grow at the same rate conditional on survival. Um, in terms of capital usage, um, I have I have a, a data moment for one year. So this is for 2004. I mentioned this already. Um, uh, Fairly Rob and Robinson, they find that women-owned firms um, use 14% less capital than otherwise identical male-owned firms. Um, so this is controlling for employment, credit history, and other firm and owner characteristics. Um, I, I will be using that, and then I'll, I'll explain how I'm inferring. I'll be using that data for one year, and I'll uh, explain how I infer uh, data for other years, uh, infer certain things for other years. Any questions about any of this data before I before I start talking about the model? <clears throat> okay, so uh, I will also be using data on um, the number of women in the labor force working relative to the number of men uh, and in absolute terms and how that's changing over time. I'm just going to take that as given. I'm also going to take as given uh, this differential uh, wage that's calculated by Shan Clino. I'm going to take that, that calculation as given as well. This is, I'm not going to think of this as a barrier to entrepreneurship, even though it does affect decisions in entrepreneur, uh, by entrepreneurs. Uh, again, because they've already, because that other paper has already calculated the the impacts on outcomes that they're interested in uh, coming through the labor market, I'm just going to take all of that as given, and I'm, I'm going to focus on the impact of these barriers specifically to entrepreneurship, specifically to women. Pedro, um, sorry, good question. Um, so maybe I missed this, but uh, you won't have any sort of like credit constraints on women or something like that, like differential credit constraints. It's just going to be... This is going to be a tax. A tax, yeah, it's right. It's going to be so... a tax on their rental rate for capital. On their rental rate. Yeah. And... Okay, so and so this discussion about capital usage that they use fourteen percent less capital is something from which you will back out of tax or, or yeah, or, or... there's going to be a tax that's okay. consistent with that, and that's that's what I'm going. To okay, do. okay, okay, now yeah. understand. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Again, here 
essentially what Chen Quino are doing with respect to their capital distortion. Yeah. Pedro, one quick question. Would you expect yeah. some selection from women, like in some skill or something? Say that again, sir. Would you expect some selection from women, like some skill selection? I don't know, maybe they're better or worse being entrepreneurs, like Exanti or something? No, so I'm going to um, assume that they're the same except through selection into, through, into entrepreneurship. So uh, I'm going to assume some, some distribution of productivity across potential productivity across the population. And I'm going to use that to infer changes over time in, in productivity of firms by sex um, because of this change over time in selection. So because of this change over time in the fraction of women that actually become entrepreneurs relative to the fraction of men that become entrepreneurs. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So no underlying difference, but there's going to be this endogenous difference um, that shows up in that I assume is in the data. Okay, I will be making some other assumptions about differences between uh, uh, female-owned and, and male-owned firms um, that I'll get to in a second. So here's where, our, where I will start. So the, the setup of the model is going to be with some final good firm that's kind of a, a, an intermediate for the final good that consumers will be consuming. So just think about this as a final good firm that takes all the stuff being produced by real firms, uh, combines them into some unit that can be consumed and then consumers consume that okay so this is just a, a a separation that makes things easier to to present so the final good firm here is going to have this production function at the top so uh total output in this economy is going to be a ces aggregate of output from female-owned firms and output from male-owned firms there's going to be an elasticity of substitution <clears throat> between these two firms um, equal to sigma <coughs> so i'm going to assume that Output from these two types of firms is, uh, is imperfectly substitutable. I'm going to assume that there is some uh, difference in demand in, in real terms, that is to say, not coming from any kind of discrimination. There's going to be a difference in demand for stuff coming from female-owned firms relative to male-owned firms. Um, and I'm going to have one more assumption about the differences between these firms a little later. So where is this coming from? Um, Women, own, women enter some sectors more than other sectors. Um, within a sector, women-owned firms are smaller than male-owned firms, uh, just consistently through the sample. Um, I don't have the data to figure out where this is coming from. Okay? So I'm going to assume that for whatever reason, there are reasons, sorry, uh, it is just the fact that women start and run firms that are different than the firms that men start and run. And I'm going to attribute some of that to factors that have nothing to do with uh, discrimination or anything that I'm trying to, uh, to infer in my model. That is obviously, that is pure speculation and there's reason to believe that's wrong. I just don't have the data to go further. And so basically I'm going to be looking at trends over time and assuming that there are some constant differences that hold over time. Um, so, one of these differences is this elasticity of substitution. One of these differences is this uh, fee parameter. This is a difference in demand. I'm just going to assume that's there. Now, the second line here is perceived output. This takes into account that on top of any you know, real difference in demand uh, for output from female-owned versus male-owned firms, there's also this additional uh, what I called consumer discrimination, okay? So demand could be even lower for female-owned firms uh, for reasons having to do with preferences. Um, and so perceived output, this Y hat, is going to allow for that, okay? Um, so these, these, these YFs, YMs, so this just refers to the total output from female-owned versus male-owned firms. Um, Uh, again, I'm going to assume a static model here. So uh, in the paper, firms actually grow and, and exit over time. And there's gonna be some, some stationary equilibrium. Okay, so here's kind of where the real firms are. So I'll call them intermediate firms since they're in intermediate to the, the final good production. Um, the output of a firm with productivity Z 
is going to be equal to um, a times z. So a is just some common productivity term that affects everybody. Uh, z here is specific to an entrepreneur. Uh, and then they're gonna make decisions about how much capital K and how much uh, labor L to hire, okay? We've got decreasing returns to scale here. Um, there, I'm going to assume that um, output is perfectly substitutable across firms um, from the consumer's perspective, um, except for those uh, demand shifters for, uh, that I had in the last slide. Okay. Uh, but we do have decreasing returns to scale here. So this, uh, this gamma parameter, this decreasing returns to, param to scale parameter is going to be less than one. Um, I'm going to assume that this, this Z is known um, by a potential entrepreneur. So that's going to play a part in their decision of whether to become an entrepreneur or whether to just be a worker. Uh, I'm going to assume that there's a distribution of Z across the population and that the distribution is the same for women as it is for men. Okay. Um, and I'm going to uh, assume that this thing is Pareto distributed, okay? According to some scale parameter. Um, oh, what do I call that? C? I can't remember what that's called. Um, female employees, um, so this is coming from Shane Kleenow, are going to be paid uh, W, which is the male wage, times one month's one minus tau w. So this is just going to be some effective tax that women face. Um, so this is gonna capture the fact that they're paid less than men. Okay. Um, importantly, entrepreneurs, so business owners are going to perceive what they're paying workers as, as the same for male and for, and for females. The same for male workers as for female workers. Okay. In other words, this is going to exactly compensate owners for their preferences against female workers. Um, and I'm going to be assuming that all entrepreneurs have the same uh, preferences for workers. Um, there's going to be an entry cost that has to be incurred that have to that has to be incurred in order to start a firm. Um, for a man, this is just going to be um, I'm going to label it CEM. So the way I'm modeling this, this is going to be a goods cost. Um, but it's multiplied by W. In other words, I'm allowing it to scale up with the wage. Um, so this is just to kind of be more consistent with the data, especially in other contexts. Um, so scales up with the wage, but this is a goods cost. Um, and I have this one minus tau W again here in the entry cost for women. Um, this is just to capture this sense that people have that the opportunity cost for um, a female entrepreneur might be lower than for a, a male entrepreneur simply because um, they're forgoing lower wages. Now, this is a little bit tricky. I'm going to assume that entrepreneurs continue to make a wage. In other words, I assume that um, they continue to work either for themselves or for another firm if their optimal labor is less than one. Uh, but regardless, I'm assuming that running a firm does not take time. It's something they do, but they can work at the same time. <clears throat> okay, and this. But Pedro, with with, sorry, with that assumption, wouldn't you be like loading some differences between men and women that might be due to comparative advantage or something like that, like imperfect substitutability between the two types of labor to this implicit tax uh, that is there, like because like it's they're they're basically like the same because they they are paid W, but. Um, you're just taxing women or paying, paying them less because of these implicit tax, right? Yeah, so so because I'm not because I'm not trying to infer anything from the because I'm not trying to infer anything about the, the barriers facing women in terms of the labor market, mm -hmm. because I'm gonna be taking as given all labor market outcomes, what I care about here is at the end of the day, uh, what is the difference? So this can in include things like that. Okay. Um, so yeah, D does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. So for example, w when I do my kind of con counterfactual, I'm, I'm going to be keeping these, these barriers at the levels that I observed in 1982, and I'm gonna be recalculating outcomes in other years if the barriers had stayed 
um, at those 1982 levels. I'm not going to fix tau w at 1982 level. I'm going to allow that to change along with labor force participation, all of that. I'm going to allow it to change. And then I'm going to compare what happens if these barriers are stuck relative to what do we actually see? Yeah. And, and so that'll be my counterfactual. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Just, just that, I don't know, like in terms of modeling, maybe like having separate markets would have been like less, uh, I wouldn't say restrictive, but like a different way of like doing this. Uh, but I mean, I, I understand. So, so, so what would be ideal here? I, I, so from my perspective, what would be ideal here? Because we cannot literally separate all of these things from the labor market, okay? We can imagine that somebody at the start of their life is making decisions accounting for this small chance that they in fact become an entrepreneur later in life. Sh the, 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 the Sh Shayhurst Johnson cleanup paper, they did not account for that. So ideally I would redo everything that they did plus all of this on top of it. Yeah. Now the reason I didn't is because all, all of that is done. Yeah. And they have their results. It's published in Econometrica. Plus I don't have all of the, the data that they have. Uh, kind of extending to the last period in my sample, which I think is important. I wanted to get to more recent times um, than they get to. Um, and so I would have had problems doing that, uh, essentially. Yeah. But yeah, a full model would account for everything. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. But I, I believe that it's not going to make a big difference. Yeah. I don't think they lost much because at the end of the day, uh, those labor market things that they looked at, whether it's comparative advantage or, or barriers or distortions, biases. Um, I think almost fully captured the decisions that are going on uh, at the beginning of life that they were, they were focused on and didn't have a, a huge impact on, on decisions. The barriers in the future, in case they become an entrepreneur, wouldn't have had a huge impact on, on those decisions earlier on. That's okay. my impression. Okay, uh, it makes sense. Okay, thank you very so, much. Yeah, of course. Okay, so with these entry costs, so I, I said here that females face CEF and males face CEM. Um, this CEF for women can be uh, decomposed into this CEF hat uh, times this one plus tau e. So this tau e is going to be the tax that I'm focused on. This this C hat can be different than the male entry cost. But oh, again, I'm going to assume that this is something that's fixed over time and reflects some kind of real difference in the types of firms that are started by women versus men. Okay. So I'm going to assume that there is that real difference. That's the third assumption, the third and final assumption that I'll be making with respect to exogenous differences between men and women owned firms. Okay. There's uh, a variable labor cost uh, faced by female entrepreneurs. Uh, instead of W, they're they're paying W times one plus tau L, um, and the capital cost instead of the rental rate R, they're going to be paying R times one plus tau K. Okay? So effectively, these are these are all of these barriers are entering as taxes in the model. Okay, uh, and again, in this this static version, um, people in this economy are going to choose whether to become an entrepreneur or not. They are then going to work, and the the people who decided to become entrepreneurs will produce. Um, they will make their production decisions in terms of capital and labor. Uh, consumers will consume, and then everything is done. Um, we're not going to lose any intuition uh, in this simple version that that we get in the in the more extended version. Okay, uh, workforce. I'm going to call LF and LM. Um, <clears throat> this is the female and male uh, labor force. Um, the, there's going to be a competitive equilibrium here. So firms are taking all prices as given, um, and maximizing their perceived profits. Um, free entry in this setup is going to ensure that at the end of the day, in equilibrium, the profits for a marginal entrepreneur. So some Z star, uh, is going to be exactly equal to the cost of entry or the opportunity cost of entry. Okay. And so there is going to be a Z star associated with that. Um, I'll show you that profits for uh, for female entrepreneurs uh, are increasing in Z monotonically. Same thing for male entrepreneurs, and so each uh, each sex is going to have their own Z star um, that captures that that captures this threshold. Anyone below Z star will not become an entrepreneur. 
uh, goods markets, capital markets, and labor markets are all going to clear, taking as given these, these distortions. Pedro? Yeah. A quick question. So, because this assumption that you are making that uh, entrepreneurs still earn wages uh, uh, while they, they are running the business. So, I was thinking because in a full dynamic model, you would have that individuals have to make the decision. Like if you have an occupational choice structure where each period individuals have to decide whether they stay as a worker, as a wage worker, or start a business uh, as an entrepreneur, or in the other sense, if you are now running a business, you have to decide if you want to stay in the business or if you want to close the business and go back to the labor market, right? So I wondering if this assumption uh, have some implications, uh, has some implications on the exit decisions. So, because we are looking at the, the entry barriers and, and so on, but at, at the end of the day, uh, in, even if you solve the, the, the static model in two different periods, you, the entrepreneurship rate that you are going to see in, in, in the final period is going to depend on both, on the entry decisions in the initial period, but also on the exit decisions, right? Sure. So, um, no, that's a good point. So this data that I looked at, again, it's only for 2007 to 2012. This data that I looked at suggested that um, growth rates are the same. So that means that if I was to build a, a model, for example, with some stochastic shocks um, over time to productivity, and then some endogenous exit decisions, um, which is what you're talking about, I would have the same, I shouldn't say the same, I would need to have a model set up where, um, it, which was consistent with this, this fact. I mean, what I'm taking is fact that that growth rates conditional on on exit are the same for for men and women. So that would suggest to me that the, the shocks, the shock process is going to be the same for men and women. At least the, the shock process that I would have to get out of that. On top of that, I I would need to 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 have a model like that and quantify it, and calibrate it. I would need exit rates. And I just don't have them. Yeah. I just don't have them. And and not only have them for you know men versus women at a point in time, I would need that over time in order to do anything meaningful with that. And I certainly don't have any of that. So okay. so unfortunately, I just I can't do anything with that. So there's been some suggestion, for example, of some interesting things like um, I, I've seen a suggestion that that female-owned firms exit at a higher rate than male-owned firms in general. I've also seen suggestion that in a recession. I think this is only based on the last recession, but in the last recession, female-owned firms, I think were less likely, sorry, the Great Recession, I'm, I'm, I'm glossing over the COVID stuff here. In the Great Recession, female-owned firms were less likely to exit than male-owned firms, I believe, is, is what I took from that. Um, that stuff is interesting. I, I can't capture any of that here. So I'm just going to be assuming exogenous exit. Um, and so none of that can play a role. Okay, you yeah. see. And and what I also had in mind is like if there are differences in the wages, in the path of the wages between uh, men and women and uh, between 2007 and 2012, that would imply a difference in terms of the opportunity cost of, of, of being a business owner, right? So maybe yeah. that, oh, that would be simple. To be included in 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 this framework, I think. Um, yeah. So I mean, here that's all being captured by the entry decision. Yeah. Um, okay. And so that is there. I have that tau w there. But I should say between that the tau w doesn't change very much. Um, do I have that here? Sorry, one sec. Okay. So it changes from forty eight percent. The tau w. Changes from 48% to 36%. So yeah, it is changing over time. Although most of that change is done by 92. And then it, it keeps going down a little bit. Yeah, so it is there. Uh, okay, see. So I'll tell you where I do, ca so I'll, I'll tell you exactly where it is affecting things in just a moment. Um, where this this trend in TAUW will show up in, in, my, in my results in just a moment. Okay, um, thanks. Okay, but let's start here before so average revenue product of labor so this was again revenue over the wage bill or revenue over labor 
We see that for women, it's equal to that, that first bullet there. It's equal to a bunch of stuff that's exogenous uh, and more to the point, equal to a bunch of stuff that's the same for women and for, for male lung forms. This W, this, this alpha, this gamma, that's gonna show up in, for this ratio for women-owned firms and for male-owned firms. Notice this is not a function of productivity or prices huh? um, <clears throat> because it's a ratio of two things that depend on productivity and prices in the same way. What does show up in this ratio is this one minus tau L. So this is what I'm going to use to back out the, the, the higher cost of uh, using labor for female-owned versus male-owned firms. Um, when we take the ratio of this ratio for women versus male-owned firms, again, conditional on, on things that we know matter uh, other than sex, we are going to get a number that I can use to back out this 1 plus tau L. Okay? In particular, I already showed you before that this number started up around uh, 1.25 in 82 and was down to almost 1 uh, by the end of the sample. So that means tau L is going to be going from around 25% in 82 down to about zero uh, by the end of the sample, okay? Uh, the third bullet here is uh, capital labor ratio. So this is showing you the capital labor, labor ratio for female-owned firms relative to male-owned firms. So a ratio of a ratio. Um, this is showing you that it's, it's just a function of the tau L, which I already showed you how I'm getting that, and the tau K. And so if I have data on capital rate, labor ratio for a female versus a, a male-owned firm, you know, uh, I'll, I'll be able to back out this tau K. Now, I only have that data for one year, um, that uh, Fairley, Rob, and Robinson paper that I talked about earlier. They have it for 2004. I'm going to allocate that to 2002 and use that number. Uh, so the capital labor ratio that they found there uh, was 14% lower for women. And so I'm going to use that as a target and infer tau K from that. Now, how am I going to get the tau K for the rest of the sample? Um, that's going to be combined with how I get the, the tau uh, D, the consumer discrimination. Um, and I, I will get to that in a second. What I want to start off with here in this slide is uh, average revenue. I want you to notice that in this type of model, average revenue is directly proportional to average profit. Okay. Um, or to put it another way, the profit of any firm here is going to be one minus gamma times uh, revenue. And so when you take an average across firms, average profits are gonna be equal to one minus gamma times average revenue. This is important because I'm not observing profits, um, especially perceived profits. What I am observing is actual revenue of, of female owned versus male owned firms. Um, if I take a ratio of average revenues in the model, I'm going to get this, um, this expression on the right-hand side of the second equation. So this ratio here is going to be a function of the ratio of these Z stars. Okay, this is the productivity threshold that's going to represent the marginal entrepreneur by sex. Uh, the difference in prices, this is in part going to be coming from the consumer discrimination, but other stuff too. Uh, it's going to be coming from, uh, it's also going to be affected by this tau K and affected by the tau L. So all of these things. Um, so I'm a little more specific underneath that. The relative prices in this economy are going to depend on um, the relative number of firms in the economy. Um, it's going to depend in a direct way on relative revenues. And it's going to depend on that tau D, the tax, the consumer discrimination tax. Um, I want you to notice that given my assumptions about the, product, the Pareto distribution of productivity, um, if I have that Pareto parameter, if I have the value for that Pareto parameter um, that I assume characterizes the distribution, then I can immediately back out the Z star for men and for women um, just using the entrepreneurship rate. Okay? This is just a feature of the Pareto distribution. So Z star for women, for example, is just going to be equal to the entrepreneurship rate for women, as I as measured before, to the power of uh, minus one over this Pareto parameter. So that's how the data is going to be giving me the Z stars. And please go ahead. Yeah, because if if you shut down 
all the distortions and, and you only keep with the differences in wages uh, between men and women, uh, you should see a lower Z star for uh, women, right? That's right. That's correct. Uh, but I imagine that the other distortions also are going gonna play some role, and maybe that yeah. is not gonna be the the final result, right? Because I'm thinking that you said the the growth rates are gonna be more or less the same between a woman I'm and assume men. they're the same. Okay, so something else has to happen in in order to the model to generate that, right? Yes, exactly, and 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 those are. That is some of the 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 role of the all distortions. these distortions. They, they are going to be impacting it. Yeah. Okay. I see. <clears throat> okay um, next thing I'm going to do. So all this is it's the exact same equation I just showed you. The ratio of revenues. But now I've just um, plugged in the expression for relative prices. Um, I don't expect you to get a lot from here. All I'm trying to show you is that there's a bunch of stuff here that. I already know. I know revenue of female versus male-owned firms. I have that data. Okay. Imagine I have numbers for sigma. Imagine I have numbers for gamma. Whatever parameters I have here. Um, I just told you how I'm going to get this, these Z stars. So that's that's given. I I can observe how many firms there are owned by women and owned by men. I already told you how I'm getting tau L. Okay. So that means. That in this entire expression, all that's left is this tau kd. Or to put it another way, I've put everything that I don't have in this tau kd to make that expression still be the same as the second one over here. So it's the same expression. So why do I write this down? I just want to show you how I'm, so what that tau kd is equal to. This is going to be a combination of the tau k, the, the cost of, of using capital and the tau d, this consumer discrimination tax. Why am I doing this? Um, for two related reasons. I don't have the data on, on uh, capital usage for female versus male owned firms, uh, except for that one year. And I have no direct data on consumer discrimination. So what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to assume that my model captures everything. Now, I just told you that I already have relative revenues, relative average revenues. I already have the Z stars. I already have the Ns, the number of firms. I already have, just trust me, I already have the numbers for all these parameters. Okay. That means that this tau KD uh, can be thought of, can be calculated as a residual given these assumptions. Okay. Now, for 2002, I did calculate a number for tau K. That means in 2002, I can get. Uh, a value for tau d, the, the tax consumer discrimination tax. Okay. So I now have uh, both numbers for 2002. And I have how that changes over time because I've already calculated tau kd as a residual over time okay, from 1982 to 2012. And so what I'm going to do is take 2002 as a starting point. I'm going to imagine, I'm going to assume that changes in tau k and changes in tau d over time are going to contribute equally to this to the uh, calculated changes in tau kd okay i'm going to assume that they're they're equally responsible for the changes in this this whole term this composite term so with those assumptions uh, i now have numbers for tau k for tau d for tau l and for tau e so for all of these barriers um, that i'm trying to get so in the paper, I do some robustness where all of the changes in tau KD come from one rather than the other. And, and I show how the results change. Yeah, and those are, that does describe kind of the, the two bounds of what the results can be. Okay. Uh, last thing in terms of uh, inferring things about barriers. I just said I had tau E, but I haven't actually showed you how I got that. Sorry. So tau E is the last one. Um, the entry decision here in this, in this static version is just that the opportunity cost of entry has to be exactly equal to uh, the benefit of entry yeah? for the marginal entrepreneur. 
So the first line here is for, for female entrepreneurs. So this is saying that the profits of the marginal female entrepreneur who's hit by all the same barriers as everybody else, uh, as every other female entrepreneur, but has the, the further disadvantage that they, they're going to have the lowest productivity out of all of them. They have this Z, the ZF star. The profits for that, for that person have to be exactly equal to the opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost of starting this firm? Well, it's this entry cost, okay? adjusted for uh, this tau w. And remember that this CEF is equal to 1 plus tau e, which is the, cost I'm tr the, the tax I'm trying to get here, and this fixed constant um, difference in relative uh, difference in entry cost that I'm assuming uh, is there as well. And what you get out of this model then, remember, profits are proportional to revenue. And so taking the ratio of uh, profits of female entrepreneurs over the profits of male entrepreneurs, okay, uh, you get the ratio of revenue. And revenue ratios are what I observe. And so when I showed you how relative average revenue is changing over time, remember I, I told you it went from 29% to about 31 or 32% or something like that. Uh, so it increased a little bit over time. So this is telling me that the opportunity cost of starting a firm for women relative to men has increased a little bit over time. It turns out that the tau w has gone down enough that the inferred tau e here is actually declining over time. Well, let me put this another way. If tau e doesn't change, then the change in tau w a change in relative wages should have been enough to um, decrease relative average revenues over time. It didn't. And that means that something else must have offset that, and that's the tau e here. The tau e. Um, can I say that again? Tau w has been going down over time. So average revenue for women relative to men should have gone up by much more than it did. It didn't, my model says, because tau e has gone down over time. Sorry about that. Um, very quickly, some, some intuition there, because people often have problems with this. How can relative entry costs be just exactly equal to relative average revenues? I want you to think about it in the following way. If something happens, anything, to change the profitability of a woman-owned firm, of women-owned firms in general, so for example, to increase the profitability of starting a firm, okay? If that happens, you should have more women becoming entrepreneurs, yes? If the cost of, of becoming a firm hasn't changed and the benefits go up, you should see more women um, starting firms. In fact, that should continue until that profitability is shrunk all the way back down to where it started from, right? Because at, at the margin, the, benefit, the marginal benefit of starting a firm should be exactly equal to the marginal cost. So if you observe a change in uh, relative profitability over time, that tells us that there must have been a change in the relative opportunity cost of starting or running a firm over time. So that's where this is coming from. Okay, let me quickly go through the rest so we have more time for questions. Um, this is just to let you know what's going on at that tau w. This is straight from the, the uh, Shea Hurst Jones and Cleanout paper. The tau w is going down over time. A lot of it is done by the early 1990s, but it continues to go down a little bit after that. This is the entry cost uh, that I end up with. So it's starting um, relatively high and it's ending at zero. Not because I'm finding it's zero, but because um, I'm going to make an assumption here that the tau e is zero in 2012. So in that sense, to the extent that you think there are still barriers, um, this isn't going to affect the impact of declining barriers that I'm going to infer on outcomes, but this will impact this assumption that there are no entry barrier impacts in 2012 um, are going to affect my calculation of how much scope is there still for more gains in the future, okay? So, but this uh, entry cost has gone down over time. 
this tau L is going to look exactly like that um, relative average product of revenue, sorry, average product of labor. So it's gone down mostly by 92, flat after that. The tau K that I end up with uh, is pretty high at the beginning of the sample. It's 60%. And by the end of it, it's, it's rather low. It's still, still there, but it's at about 14% um, or so uh, by the end of the sample. Okay? So it is a large decrease. And finally, this consumer discrimination. Again, uh, I can't identify a level here. I can only identify a, a trend. So what this is telling you is that this, this, well, okay. I'm going to assume tau D is zero uh, by the end of the sample. And under that assumption, I'm finding that it was around 7% at the beginning. So it hasn't changed too much. So there was a slightly less demand for output from female owned firms at the beginning of the sample relative to the end of the sample. Good. Yeah. So you have uh, like five, six minutes, minutes left to, to have so, a few to a few minutes to for questions on that okay. at the end. So I'll go through this extremely quickly. So you understand the counterfactual already. I, I'm just um, forcing the the barriers to stay at their 1982 levels, and I'm going to see how outcomes would have changed over time. Okay, um, this is an important one. So this is entrepreneurship rates. Okay, um, for for women, let's start at the bottom. So the counterfactual is the same as the benchmark in 1982 because the barriers are the same. Okay, but by 2012, instead of increasing to 18% uh, entrepreneurship rate, uh, women would have stayed at around 9%. Now, as a consequence, because there would have been less pressure, less competition from women, more men would have started businesses. Okay, um, and so instead of men going from 17% to 20, they would have gone from 17 to around 22%. Okay. The share of firms owned by women would have uh, gone down okay, to about, uh, whatever that is, 25%, okay, instead of going up to about 45%. Um, aggregate output per worker, um, so this is kind of flipping it over. This is showing you aggregate output per worker with barriers as I calculated them relative to what it would have been if uh, barriers had stayed constant at 1982 levels. And so just skipping right to the end here, this is telling us that output per worker in 2012 is eight and a half percent higher than it would be if barriers were still at their 1982 level. This is aggregate output per worker in the economy. Uh, now, worker welfare, this is essentially wages. This is telling you that wages uh, for men and women um, as a result of the decline in barriers are uh, around two, two and a half percent higher than they otherwise would be. Um, and this is a combination of that small increase in wages and the large increase in uh, the number of women that are becoming entrepreneurs. Okay, that's a large amount of entrepreneurial income that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And so the increase in welfare here um, is going to be almost 50 percent. Again, this is with the low barriers relative to uh, if barriers had not changed in 2012. Um, women are about almost 50 percent better off whereas men are about seven, seven and a half percent worse off than they would be uh, in 2012. <clears throat> Again, this is in addition to any gains from, uh, that were calculated by the Shahers, Jones and Cleanout paper. Okay. So you can think about this as being uh, over and above any labor market gains. Um, and to put those output, um, Put those output per worker uh, gains in perspective. Um, this would this would this would be about twelve percent of actual observed changes over time in um, actual observed changes over time in U.S. aggregate productivity. Sorry, output per worker. Okay, so about twelve percent of that, which is about in line uh, with the the impact of the lower labor market barriers for women over time. Uh, finally, scope like scope for future gains. So if the barriers that I'm assuming are not zero, so tau K and tau L were in fact brought down to zero uh, in 2012, then output would be an, an additional 2% higher. Um, female entrepreneurs would be an additional 6% higher and male entrepreneurs would be uh, an additional 2% uh, worse off. Okay, so sorry, I'll stop there. Um,
So this is all just repeating that. Uh, I'll just mention, so I have other work uh, that I've been doing with, um, with uh, Sanju Huang on black entrepreneurs. It's a similar exercise that we do. Um, there's some differences, but it's pretty similar in spirit. And we're getting relatively similar findings for, for the impact of black entrepreneurship as well over time. Okay, I'll stop there. <clears throat> and thank you for, for listening. Um, thank you so much, Pedro. And um, so now we have like 10 minutes for questions. So if anyone has a question. Maybe I, I can start, I can jump in. So I, I was wondering uh, if there, of course it's, it's, it's very difficult to measure, but uh, in terms of non-pecuniary non benefits, so, so do you think also there might be a role, uh, changes in non-pecuniary benefits uh, between these two periods of time that might have some implications in terms of the, 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 the entry decision of women uh, to, to, to entrepreneurship? Yes. And I think, let, let me be as critical as possible of what I've just showed you. Um, so in the paper, I do allow for differences in preferences for being an entrepreneur rather than a worker, but they're fixed over time. And the reason for that is I use data that's kind of at a moment in time and, and that's it. Now, first of all, yes, there's no reason to believe those would be fixed over time. And second of all, um, presumably they are affected by, uh, they could be affected by changes in, uh, in the barriers themselves. So it could be that, you know, as, as wage differences have narrowed over time, um, women feel less um, put out uh, being a worker there's less preference for doing something else just to get out of this, you know, bad situation, not bad necessarily, but this situation where, you know, there's this constant, whatever, feeling that uh, you're not valued. Yeah. Um, now there's still these barriers to entrepreneurship. Um, those have gone down over time. So, you know, which one of these are going to dominate? I don't know. And again, without any data, my, my strategy was, or my, my thinking at the beginning of this was without any of this data, there's no point in me even really in, in thinking about this overly much um, because I won't be able to discipline anything I do. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I say that there's, I, I do, I do assume that, that women prefer entrepreneurship uh, a little more than men. This is something that comes out of uh, some um, PSED data um, in the U S. So this is data that, uh, that Hearst and Pugsley uh, have looked at. Yeah. Um, and so I, I can look at that by sex and I have, and I find that the women, female entrepreneurs cite non-pecuniary reasons for becoming an entrepreneur more than men do. And so I, I just take that as given and I assume that that's true throughout the sample and in some fixed way. I see. So I don't know if there is any other question. Bernabe wrote a question in the chat. Oh, He's sorry. Saying Tau D might go to zero since women determine a growing share of expenditures. Yeah, so I, I've thought a bit about making that fee parameter, which is you know real differences in demand, uh, as changing over time due to um, a change over time in the share of expenditure kind of controlled by women. At the end of the day, and after talking to some labor market, like time use economists, I, I, I ended up just not touching that. So, so why, first of all, a lot of the changes in the labor market over time are kind of either before my sample or right at the beginning of my sample, like the first 10 years and not as much has changed since, uh, since the early nineties, for example. Um, the other one is it, it really wasn't clear to me how to think about control of expenditures. Um, for sure, women generate more income as a share of total income than they did before. Okay, that's been going up as a share of total income over time. In terms of control, um, that to me is not so clear. Uh, it is clear that a lot of expenditure was at least kind of 
in some descriptions, were controlled by women to start with. Now, they are earning more of the money that is being used to, to, to buy things. Okay, that's true. But at the same time, we've had um, changes in marriage rates, changes in the composition of households. I just don't know what the overall impact is going to be on kind of control of expenditure. Um, and so I ended up just not, I did look to see if there's any kind of independent measure of control of expenditure of by sex that I didn't find. Um, and in the end, I, I decided to just not touch that. But of course, that could be part of the story here. Bernabe says, thanks. <laughs> I have the chat open now. Yes. <laughs> and and I, I have another question related to the, the this Z start. Um, if you have any, any idea or maybe if, if the model uh, does say anything about uh, how this Z star has changed over time for, for both for men and, and women? Oh, sure. So if given that Z star comes directly from the data, okay, um, let me find that expression. So at the very bottom here, Z star is a cutoff. So um, in a Pareto distribution, the, the cutoff is a direct function of the fraction of, of the distribution that is above the cutoff versus below, right? But I know that fraction, that's the entrepreneurship rate. So, I mean, inter interpreting the data through my model, everyone above Z star must be an entrepreneur. Everyone below must not be an entrepreneur. So I know exactly where Z star must be as long as I know what that Pareto parameter is. Okay? And I get that from looking at some, some kind of firm distribution data. Once I have that number, this is directly from there. So if you take a look here, um, there's a negative exponent. So the higher the entrepreneurship rate is, it must be the case that the Z star is lower. So what this is saying is that um, Z star has gone down over time for men, but just a little bit. It's gone down a lot for women. Okay? And that means average Z across all female entrepreneurs has gone down a lot relative to men. Again, that is to say the average, on, the average female entrepreneur is much lower productivity than the average female entrepreneur was in 1982. Yeah? Because they're different people. They're at different points of the distribution. I should say, the average in a Pareto distribution is also just a direct function of the Z star. And if, if, if you couldn't have other distortions in the model that also would be translated into the optimal or the target size of the firms, right? But in the, in this case, because the all, that all is, distortions. That is directly related to the size of the firm, yeah. So you can think about your Z star, which is essentially telling you Z star alone is going to tell you um, the size of a firm relative to, sorry, the Z of a firm is going to tell you the size of the firm relative to all other firms. Um, once you include data on the number of people actually working, uh, Z is going to tell you the size of a firm relative to all other firms it, in terms of employment. Um, it's going to tell you the average size of firms. It's going to tell you all of that. And so as Z star goes down, as the number of firms is going up, an easier way to think about that is average size is just people divided by number of firms. Yeah. If conditional on the number of people, if you're increasing the number of firms, you must be decreasing the average size. Okay. So the average size of firms here is going down and the average size of, of uh, female firms relative to male firms should be going down as well, except that we have these other distortions happening as well, changing over time. And so at the end of the day, actually, we get uh, a little bit of an increase in the average size of female on firms relative to male on firms. Because of the lower tau L, because of the lower tau K, et cetera, et cetera. So any other questions? So I think um, we want to thank you, Pedro. <laughs> thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh...
and we will see later in 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 the office hours yes okay so thank you very much all right thanks everyone in a bit that was great bye bye